Hi, we're continuing on Luke, but I wanted to share something with you first. I um, am creating a rosary wall. So um, I've been collecting icons and I made a whole map of it. And this is one of the, uh, it, this isn't a real icon, um, but it was the closest I could get. And I just um, glued it and painted um, and put the picture on the front. So that'll be nice. And then um, I that's the ascension so for each mystery there will be an icon um and this was the largest one because i couldn't get this small and i love this one so yeah um and then um okay and then i ordered for the miraculous metal part you know for the, when the rosary this is going to be a rosary wall um, and so I ordered this, um, which is just like a real, uh, and I'll get, I'll sit, put the link for you guys because this was such a nice company, um, the sacred heart something, but I'll put a link, uh, but they sent all these little gifts inside, um, uh, which was nice. Um, and they sent the book, The Secret of the Rosary by uh, Louis de Montfort with all the stuff on the back. And then what was really nice was the Roman ritual. And it talks about the um, each of the blessings. And it tells you um, the blessing uh, for the candles, the oil. And so I thought that was nice. Yeah. So anyway, so, oh, and then they also sent um, two blessed metals. Ah, where'd the other one go? Okay, there it is. Um, and it said, um, these metals have been blessed by a priest, which I thought was so sweet. So look at that. Isn't that nice? So, um, my rosary wall is also going to have for the beads, um, this, um, with the beads, with a bead on top wrapped in the, um, wrapped in the uh, leaf. It'll be kind of folded up a little. And then they'll be sitting on this other gold thing I'm waiting um, for, which uh, is coming from China. So it's taking a while to get here. And I have other icons that are coming. Um, I When I was looking for icons, this doesn't go into the, any of the, um, doesn't go into any of the uh, uh, mysteries for this one, but um, I wanted to get a little icon of the Holy Family, so I found that one. And there, th this is the size I wish I could have gotten for all of them, but I couldn't get them for like something like this um, uh, for when he comes out of the tomb because, or is this the Ascension? Um, so anyway, uh, it's for the Glorious Mysteries. And um, that's what I'm going to have on my rosary wall. And, of course, the crucifix is going to be the crucifix you see above me. So um, I wish I could have gotten all of them in this size because I have a very small um, area up there. But I think it'll look cute. So I'll show it to you when it's done, obviously. Okay, so, oh, and then I got for the pointer, so when I'm doing the Glorious Mysteries, I'll point. I actually got um, the Jewish... Um, uh, Torah pointer. This was just on eBay. It was like $20. Oh, it's so heavy. Um, but it's got a little hand, a little brass hand. So I'm going to attach this. Uh, hopefully it's so heavy. Um, I'm going to attach this to, um, a pointer so I can show it when I'm doing the glorious mysteries rosary. So when I get it all up, it might take another month because, uh, one of the orders got, they're coming, one of the icons is coming from Serbia, and then another one's coming from Poland, and they're, st you know, I ordered them weeks ago, but they're still not here, so this makes it a little lighter being in the bottom, but it's very heavy, so, um, and I'm going to attach this to an extendable one so that I can point to it as I'm doing the, um, each bead as I'm doing the glorious um, Mysteries Rosary, so we'll see how that works out. So, I wanted to show you that before we started. So, let's get us started. All that painting I've been doing. Um, okay, so, remember we were on, um, uh, of course, we're in the 11th of the 
12 biblical periods and with the 13th of the 14 narrative books. Um, and so last we left, he was thrown out of the house by hypocrites, and he's about to teach them two very powerful lessons um, that we said we were going to talk about, and here we are. Um, so, uh, I don't know if this is in the way or not. I'll get it out of the way just in case. Um, so he's in Nazareth. Um, with, uh, so we're on, we're on 431. We're starting on Luke 431. Um, he is in Nazareth, his hometown, and he tells them he's fulfilling the scripture in, um, in his presence, meaning he is the Messiah. And they said, aren't you Joseph's son? He brought up El Elias, Elisha's, uh, healing a leper and they were filled with wrath and they threw him out. Um, so he goes to Galilee and he's teaching uh, on the Sabbath at the synagogue when a demon cries out um, of a man who asks, is, are you here to destroy you? That he, he says him and ask if he's there to destroy him. And he says, I know who you are. You're the whole, you are the Holy One of God. Um, and Jesus told him, be silent and come out of him. And the, and when the demon was thrown out down to the mist, he came out of them and they were all amazed. And so of course, uh, th it proves his power, right? That's number one, lesson number one, lesson number two, the reports go out all over the region. Okay. Um, and he wants people to know because he's trying to announce I'm here. I'm the son of God and I'm here. And so, um, he left the synagogue, the healing at Simon's house. He left the synagogue and went to Simon's house. Um, now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and he healed her and, um, she rose immediately and waited on them. So more proof. And by the end of the day, sick people with various diseases lined up to be healed. And he healed them all. And some of them, demons came out of them. And they called out that he was the son of God. And um, But he wouldn't let them speak. He would not allow them to speak. He's not going to give the devil any time. And we shouldn't either. Um, so Jesus preaches in the synagogues in Judea. The next day it says he went to a lonely place. So I'm guessing he had to go and recharge a little bit himself. He is human. So people are trying to stop him from leaving, but he told them I must go to other cities. I was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom. I was sent for this purpose. And look at that. So um, there was one part here I wanted to show you. Um, turn down the noise. Um, in this is in breakthrough. Twice Luke mentions that Jesus would go away to a lonely place, and he was almost always surrounded by people. So it makes sense sometimes he needs to just get away to a quiet spot where he could rest and pray. And that's important to us. We all need to have somewhere to go where we can be um, uh, alone and spend time in God's presence. Where is your lonely or quiet place? Um, and where do you go to be alone with your thoughts? And next time you are there, try this prayer. And it gives the kids a prayer. Um, so, you know, it's, it is very important. You know, that is um, what's needed. So, um, John, or Jesus, calls the first disciples. While people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he decided to teach people from a boat. Um, and when he was done, he told uh, Simon um, to put out their nets. And they said, well, we already have and there's no fish. And he said, and he said, but at your word, I will. And that's what we need to say to God. When he says, tells us to do something, we shouldn't argue or say, well, I've tried that. No, you just do it. A great big load of fish came so much that their nets were breaking. How about that? Um, they were astonished, and Jesus said, Do not be afraid. Um, they will be catching men. So he made his choice because they listened, and that's why he chose these, these uh, apostles. They followed him immediately. 
um, and they left everything. I can't imagine right now leaving everything and someone saying, come follow me. I mean, I'm like, oh, how could, where would I sleep? And oh my gosh. And, you know, so, I mean, we don't follow him that way today, but we need to follow him. And, you know, so, um, let's move on here. Uh, and, um, they, yeah, he chose them, they left everything, and they were just so obedient. So, um, and when it tells you, uh, he wants us, when he tells us, he wants us to be open. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for people open to his word. He shut down the Pharisees, but he opened them up. Um, what he does tell us to do, it makes so much, it makes so much easier for us when we listen, <laughs> if you haven't figured that out. Um, so, uh, we need to do that every morning. We need to sit and spend that time alone, the, the St. Ignatius uh, 15 minutes every morning in silence. Do whatever you have to to tune into him, whether looking at his picture, um, like I do. I look directly at his picture that you see here behind me. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, you can look at the Bible, but don't get to reading where you're not focusing on hearing him. So um, whatever it is, don't be afraid of the silence. Do the St. Ignatius exercises. Learn them from that book, The Sacred Story. Um, it helps to under it helps you to understand because they can be complicated. So or they sound complicated, but they're really not. Um, Jesus cleanses the leper. Okay, so um, the next one uh, the is the 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 guy is full of leprosy and he begged him and immediately he he says. Uh, come forward or he he comes forward and he says um heal me and he says i will just four words i will and then be clean and immediately the leprosy left him and he told him um go make an offering for your cleansing and then he said and for proof for people so he do you make an offering when you get a blessing um we, we need to look at what he's telling him. Go make an offering when you get a blessing. Um, do you let everyone know and praise him? He's, he wants them, he wants people to know, you know, where to give him that glory so that not, not to be, not to brag, obviously, it's to, um, to show the lighthouse, to say, this is where you get help. And he's the lighthouse. And when we share that light, the people know where to go get that light. Um, so uh, I'm sure he uh, he knew the report went abroad and people started gathering to hear him um, to be healed. So um, then he withdraws into the wilderness and prayed. He probably again needed to gather some strength. He knew a lot of people were going to be coming. Um, and so uh, let's see. And then he gets to, um, yeah, and we need to remember especially mothers, we need to take that time to recharge and get connected to God, reconnected to God. Um, Jesus heals a paralytic. Um, I guess he knew he was about to be inundated uh, with more, so teachers were actually coming, um, as were the Pharisees, of course, and the teachers of the law came um, from every village of Galilee, Judeo, and from Jerusalem, and then um, there were just crowds so some men brought a, a fellow on a bed and um they couldn't get through because of the crowd um so they um sent him through the roof and we all know this story and um jesus was uh uh he you know it shows their determination in their faith so uh what does the lord do he saw their faith and he liked it so much that he granted their request um but of course, there's always troublemakers. Um, so okay, so they grant he granted their his request, and everybody's amazed, obviously. Um, but before he does, um, there's always troublemakers. Those people that think they know everything instead of observing, they decide to come and take control and complain. You know, people that complain are always uh, trying to take control, right? Um, so they're like, well, uh, you know. Who is speaking? Who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive skin uh, sins? Only God. 
Um, I'm not saying I would recognize if someone was um, healing people because you see this kind of stuff all the time and we're told that, you know, people are going to uh, be healing people and there's always going to be the, the fakes. Um, so, but it says here that Jesus perceived their questionings, meaning he understood and he was reading their motives. And um, so Jesus asked, well, why do you question in your hearts? Uh, I probably would have said, oh, it's kind of hard to trust people. But um, my guess is uh, he would say exactly what he said to them by taking the action that he took. Um, and, you know, when you want to direct your children, you will ask them with only two choices. So he says, um, uh, well, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? Um, and so he says that um, and he's really you know, we're just directing them. And then he shows it quite dramatically because um, he, he also says he has authority to forgive sins. And they don't, you know, they're, he's saying, but you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he's telling them, I'm the Son of Man. Um, and then he turns to the man and says, I say to you, rise, take up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose. And, you know, they're all like, what's happening? Uh, amazed. And um, it, it, and they all glorified God. They were filled with awe, saying, we have seen strange things today. So he didn't just do a little with a little miracle. It was a dramatic miracle. And we know it. So it doesn't, you know, it kind of loses its punch uh, when people hear these stories over and over again. But when you look at, th they were amazed and it sees them all. And they're like, what's happening? So um, anyway, so Jesus calls Levi. Um, they don't give you what happens just before. Uh, they just say that um, he sees the tax collector, Levi, and says, follow me. And that's it. The guy leaves everything and follows him. And then he makes him a great feast at his house um, and a large with large company of tax collectors. So they were all sitting at the table and the Pharisees murmured against him because some of the tax collectors are Pharisees as well. Um, and they mur or no, they, they were not Pharisees as well. They murmured against him sitting with tax collectors and sinners. I don't know why I said that. Um, now, uh, I looked up what Pharisees were and this is what it said. The Pharisees formed a large, I, I this, I don't remember what website it is, but basically it said they formed a largest and most influential religious political party in New Testament times. They are consistently depicted in the Gospels as antagonists or opponents of Jesus Christ and the early Christians. The name Pharisee means separated one. The Pharisees separated themselves from society to study and teach the law, but they also separated themselves from the common people because they considered themselves, they considered them, the other people, religiously unclean. Um, as I'm sure you know, people get too caught up in the law of things and they miss out on the people of things, you know. So that's basically what these Pharisees seem to be. And, there's, and if you notice, there's always someone ready to point out when you're wrong or where you're wrong. And I'm not saying to educate people isn't a good thing, but it's the sneering way that people do like these Pharisees. I, I learn from everyone I meet and that's my goal. And then I try to teach others from what I've learned. And yes, of course, we try to make sure it's correct to the best of our ability. Um, you always take into account the source and then you research it. And so I don't know why people get so uptight. You can always research and I don't need to set anyone straight. I'm just sharing. That's all. Um, so if anyone corrects me, I'm happy. And I say, okay. Uh, so, but it's depending on how they're going to correct me, you know. Um, I'm no more educated than, you know, in theological issues than anyone else, except I do study a lot. Um, but I'm not going to claim to be an expert. I don't have a degree in theology. I don't intend on getting one. Um, so my purpose is to try to get to heaven and help my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren and great-great-great-great-grandchildren and so on. So the Pharisees, it says, um, probably got their start under Maccabees um, uh, at uh, 160 BC, emerging as a scholarly class dedicated to the teaching of both the written and oral law, stressing the internal side of 
Judaism. Um, and the historian Flavus Josephus numbered them at 6,000 in Israel at their peak. He described the Pharisees as maintaining a simple lifestyle, affectionate and harmonious in their dealings with others, respectful of elders, and influential throughout Israel, except to Jesus. Um, Middle class businessmen and trade workers, uh, the Pharisees started and controlled the synagogues, those Jewish meeting places that served both local and uh, worship and education. They also put great importance on oral tradition, making it equal to the laws written in the Old Testament. The Pharisees were extremely accurate and detail-oriented in all matters pertaining to, pertaining to the law of Moses. And then it gives some uh, Bible sites, but it does say Luke 11.39. Um, and 1812. While they were sound in their professions and creeds, their system of religion was more on the outward form than genuine faith. Um, but they were respected because they were considered spious, or pious. Um, but evidently, they were very threatened by Jesus because that's what people usually do. They criticize when they're threatened by someone. So Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need for a physician. Those who are sick um, I've come for those who are sick. Um, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Um, oops, sorry, my thing. Um, so he's calling sinners to repentance. Um, but don't worry, he sets them straight, Luke 11. Uh, the Pharisees in Luke 11, that was it was talking about. The question about fasting, and I like this part. Um, so, um, they couldn't argue with that, with what he said, but like I said, don't worry, he's going to set them straight. Um, so what he did do, they tried to find a place to get, you know, to get him in the gotcha, uh, question. So they say, um, this is their next, uh, challenge. Um, so they say, well, the disciples of John, oh, well, they fast so often and they offer prayers. Um, so did the, dis and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And then he comes back with the greatest answer. Can you make a wedding guest fast when the bridegroom is with them? <laughs> And then the sad part comes when he says the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in those days. Then he goes into this parable. Um, and this is interesting. Um, he says, no one tears a piece. Hold on. Sorry. This thing keeps messing up. Um, no one tears a piece from a new garment uh, and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Now, I went to studylight.org. If you don't know it, it's a great site for looking at what every single verse means studylight.org um it goes verse by verse in the bible and they give an interpretation of things that might need clarification something usually simple but something like a parable they gave a lot and um so i'm going to give a little bit of what they said they said there are three comparisons um new cloth on an old garment uh, new wine and old wineskins, and no man having drunk old wine desires new. The meaning is very simpler, similar in all three. They stress Jesus' unwillingness to make the ceremonial fast of the Old Testament a large new feature of the new kingdom. The necessity of finding new, quote, wineskins, and then it has in parentheses disciples, who will be more able to receive his new teaching as in the call of Matthew. Uh, they mention Matthew a little bit. They they do comparison. And Jesus' understanding of that fact that many of John's disciples, though not all, would prefer the old ways than the new methods of approaching kingdom. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then it goes on to where they compare Matthew a little bit to Luke and others. So the variation between Matthew and Luke derive from... Luke's fuller report, whereas Matthew mentioned the patching the old garment with the new cloth, Luke has a fuller account of the new cloth having been rent 
from a new garment. Matthew abbreviated the discussion, even omitting it altogether with the third analogy given by Luke. Then it goes into a little bit of the comparison of the gospel. So I thought I would add it. They explain that Jesus himself with his parables, illustrations, and teachings from place to place and time to time, um, because obviously he's not going to say things verbatim from town to town, city to city. So the apostles didn't write exactly all the same as we know. Um, so they explained to the, the they explained the apostles also wrote from diverse viewpoints. John gave seven great signs, Matthew seven great woes against the Pharisees, and Luke a vast body of material of particular interest to Gentiles, etc. Then they mentioned the diversity in the Gospels is so extensive as to deny absolutely any possibility of there being in any sense copies of one another. Um, and then it goes into inherent in the threefold analogies of the kingdom Jesus gave at Matthew's dinner party uh, is the fact that the, quote, newness of the kingdom of Christ it was not merely to be a patch imposed upon Judaism, nor a mere refilling of old forms with vital new truth. The, quote, new wine, new garment, unquote. Here is a glimpse of the truth stressed by the apostles. Behold, all things are become new in 2 Corinthians 5.17. So then I just wanted to show you real quick this next part, old and new. Um, so what's up with the parable of the patches and the wineskins? When, when was the last time you had a piece of clothing patched and what in the world is a wineskin? These are images which we have a hard time understanding because they are probably not part of our uh, you know, lives. So when Jesus was really talking about here is the difference between the old and the new. For example, if your family or school has an old computer and you try to install a brand new program, uh, it probably won't work. The new program simply can't handle the old soft, the new software. Um, and that's how it's good for, for kids to understand because that's what's their world. Um, Jesus is making a point about the new message he's trying to share with his followers. People were sometimes more concerned with following the rules rather than getting closer to God. It's not so much about all the rules. It is about acting out of love and compassion. And that's the good news that is the new program to install within our hearts and souls. So I thought that was beautiful. And especially good to explain that way to kids. So we'll continue tomorrow. We'll continue on with Luke. Um, I hope you enjoyed today. And I hope you enjoyed seeing my components I'm going to put on my rosary wall. So thank you and have a blessed day.